Okay, we're glad you joined us this evening. We'll prepare ourselves in our usual fashion by having a few moments of silent prayer, the option of naming to God any unconfessed sins. And I forgot to tell you the date, so I'm telling you now. It is April the 15th, 2000, <coughs> excuse me, 2021. So uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day of your grace and your evidence that you are in control of all things. We thank you for the rain we just received, uh, maybe enough to hold us for a while. And we thank you for all the things that you do behind the scenes in order to motivate us, to guide us, to help us to get to the point where you want us to be so that we can be good and faithful servants and that we can look forward to the great things that you have for us in eternity. So we pray that you will help us to focus and concentrate this evening, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, when we're studying the Bible and we're seeing God's revelation of those who came before us, what they did and what the results of what they did might be isn't just so that we can know biblical history. We are to learn from the mistakes that our predecessors have learned the hard way. We want to learn uh, not the hard way, but by acquiring knowledge and then applying that knowledge. That goes for Sundays, too. I might say even especially Sundays, because I'm in Genesis. If I'd have known how Genesis would have went, I wouldn't have called it major Bible events. I would have called it Genesis. I've been about what, a year and a half, two years maybe, in Genesis. It's been a long time. Uh, so it really is uh, the book of Genesis that I'm teaching verse by verse, essentially. I think when I get to the end of Genesis, which isn't that far, we're in verse th uh, chapter 37. In fact, we finished chapter 37 last Sunday. We'll be going on to chapter 38, and Genesis has 50 chapters, and some of these should be going fairly shortly. But I'm thinking that when we get to the end of Genesis, I might go on to Exodus, but this time actually major on major Bible events. We'll see. In any uh, case, let's go to our Bibles in Romans chapter 2, and we're going to start with verse 17. We've already covered chapter 2, verse 17, but we've done verses 17, 18, and 19. We're going to start with verse 20, but starting with verse 17, reading it will give us a context. So Romans chapter 2, verse 17. But if you bear the name Jew and rely upon the law and boast in God and know his will and approve the things that are essential, actually that word is better, excellent, or maybe even superior, know the things that are superior. This is talking about Bible doctrine about his word being instructed out of the law and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness. And tonight we, we start verse 20. A corrector of foolish, a teacher of the immature, having in the law the embodiment of the knowledge of the truth. Paul is not commending these people. He's talking about the things that they do, but as we went through each one of these, for instance, they say that they have the knowledge through the law, through the scriptures, but they're not obedient to that knowledge. And verse 17 says, if you 
bear the name of Jew and rely upon the Lord and boast in God and so forth. Well, they bore the name Jew, and I explained to you last time how that name came about. They were very proud of their heritage. They were proud that they were the chosen people. They were cho proud that the head of their nation was God. All these things they were proud of, but not in the way that they should be. When they boasted about God, they didn't go to the Gentiles and talk about how wonderful and great and merciful and just, compassionate, loving, gracious. They didn't explain these those things to the Gentiles. They were boasting about God in the sense that we have what you don't have. The God of the universe is over our nation, ha, ha, ha. And we've got the law, and you're all a bunch of bumbling idiots. That was the way they came across. That's the way these verses come across. And so it's really not commending them. And they knew the will of God. That's in verse 18. But just because they knew the will of God did not mean that they followed the will of God. And they're confident, they were confident, that they were a guide to, uh, to the blind and a light to those who were in darkness. And that's, what, that's where we ended. And I'll tell you again, they were confident that they were a guide to the blind and a light who are in darkness. The, the truth of the matter was that they were not guiding the blind as if they didn't have the capacity to see. And they could have seen what God wanted them to see if the Jews weren't so almighty and arrogant and condescending to these Gentiles. They were in darkness, but it wasn't their fault. It was the Jews' fault for being a cut above. They were very prideful. And so they were in darkness because God was depending on the Jews to give the truth of God's word and all the wonderful things to them, and they didn't even like the Gentiles. They really didn't care what happened to them. So that brings us up to verse 20. I'll put it on the board. Chapter 2, verse 20. I have one, the last verse from the previous message, which was Tuesday. It's Matthew 15, 14. I was making the case that the Jews knew only what their leaders had taught them. And so the things that they taught them were really not leading the blind, but causing them to be blind, if you understand what I'm saying. This is what Jesus Christ, our Lord, said about the leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees. He called them a brood of vipers. He called them uh, hypocrites. Woe unto you, hypocrites. But here in Matthew 15, 14, he says, let them alone. He's talking about the people leaving the leaders alone. He says that they are blind guides of the blind, and if a blind man guides a blind man, both will fall into the pit. And that's where they were. And it, it shows us how important it is if you have a choice to choose to be under leaders that are worthy of the office that they have. All we have to do is look at our own country. Wow. Uh, it, it's very important to choose people who are going to have authority very carefully and you have to look at their character. Do they have integrity? Those things are very important. So now in Romans chapter 2, verse 20, it goes on and says, A corrector of the foolish, a teacher, <coughs> excuse me, a teacher of the immature. And the immature Greek, the Greek word for immature here is napios. 
That's N-E-P-I-O-S, and it's referring to babies, infants. So the Jews considered themselves a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of the babies, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and of the truth. This is a mindset that is being described here of what the Jews thought about themselves. And it is an inaccurate description. The Jews had a very condescending attitude towards the Gentiles because of their heritage. After all, they came from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were covenantal people. God was the in charge of their nation. They had the feast days. They had the scriptures. They had the prophets. They had so many things going for them. So th that's why they were condescending towards the Gentiles because of their heritage and because they had the law, which they thought made them superior to everyone else. Now, I would make the claim that the scriptures are above everything else regarding law or anything else. This is the embodiment of truth. The scriptures are. And the part that deals with the law comes from God and is absolutely just and right and supersedes everything else. But they took that knowledge and they started crying about themselves and comparing to others that didn't have these privileges and mocked them and just felt totally superior. There was no way the Gentiles could learn from people like the Jews at that time who considered them to be intellectually and morally blind who considered them to uh, or believed that they were fools who needed correction and regarded them as babies who knew nothing. That was their attitude. We just saw it in the verse. That's what they thought they were doing <clears throat> or what their mission was. Now, I ask you, if you had a teacher that thought that you would embody everything that they said here that you're intellectually and morally blind and you were fools who needed correction and you were babies that knew nothing and you knew that, that this teacher thought that, what would you think? Would you want to be taught by a teacher like that? That's a sign of arrogance. And arrogance brings on a plethora of ills and woes. <laughs> I think back when it was in 1963, 63 or 64, that's when the folk music was big. Peter, Paul, and Mary, and many others. And I wanted so bad to be able to play a guitar and sing along with them. So I got a guitar and was going to, to take my first guitar lesson. It was off of Shepherd Boulevard across from a big theater. I can't remember the name of it. But it was in a strip center, and this Italian was going to teach me how to play the guitar. And as I was standing uh, waiting for my turn to go in, this girl was sitting beside me, and she was playing on her guitar, Michael rode the boat ashore. And I thought, if I could ever just even learn how to play that one song, it would be so great. So finally it was my turn. So I go in there, and this man's name was Gestantes. He was an Italian. He weighed about 300 pounds. And I sat down. I knew nothing about the guitar. He showed me a little bit how to hold it and everything. And he was trying to show me how to play notes. Well, I didn't read, I still don't read music. And I, I was supposed to play these notes. And you can imagine, I, I was a little bit nervous. I didn't know him, have this real new to me. And I would start playing and playing the notes, and when, when I played one wrong, he would throw his hands, no, 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 that's all wrong, that's all wrong. And I, 
you know, I'm against the wall. And I'm thinking, of course, then I couldn't, I didn't even know how to hold the guitar anymore. I mean, I was so <laughs> taken aback by that. So the rest of the lesson was grueling, and I couldn't wait to get out of there. Needless to say, that was my first and last lesson. So I went and got a, maga a, a, a booklet. It, it was like you, you have sheet music. Well, this was teach you how to play the guitar, self-taught. So I had the guitar, so I taught myself. But the reason I'm telling you that, when leaders would try to teach you that way, now I'm not saying they were that odious or that they were that out, out of bounds, but I didn't want to be in, in his sight even for another moment. So when you have all those things in your teacher's mind, they're not going to be encouraging. They'll probably be very condescending. And they didn't really want to, in fact, they didn't evangelize or give doctrine to these people like they should have, mainly because they hated them. So there's no way the Gentiles could learn from them. The Jews were not really interested in guiding, teaching, or correcting the Gentiles anyway because they didn't want to have anything to do with them. And you can see why. Oh, we are the upper crust. We are the elite. We are head and shoulders above everyone else. And so it turned them into being hypocrites, as we'll see. They wouldn't enter the homes of a Gentile, nor would they eat with them. Jesus did both, and his own people ripped him to pieces because of it. Sometimes they call them dogs. And by the way, it's not like your sweet little pet dog. In the ancient time, dogs were mostly wild. Very few had pets. They were dirty. They, called, uh, uh, they caused diseases. Uh, they, they just were, let's say, persona non grata among people. So when you call somebody a dog, it was not a compliment. I can't remember the scripture, but I remember, and it's in the Old Testament when it's this in, probably in Leviticus or Numbers. It's saying that. If you are a prostitute or a dog, and the dog was referring to male prostitutes. So my point is the Jews and Gentiles did not get along, and the Gentiles uh, had a bad light about the Jews because of their behavior and their attitude, and even of their God, as we will see. So the Gentiles might hear how advanced the Jews were and how great the law was, but they dismissed it all because the Jews were not keeping the law themselves, so they became hypocrites in the eyes of the Gentiles. We see this all the time, don't we? People who are in high standing, everybody reveres them, looks up to them, and then you see their feet of clay. It's not what you say, it's what you do. And it's not how you look, it's what your attitude is that makes the difference. So we have four things here listed that the Mosaic Law did for, did four things for the people of the Old Testament. When it says the law, essentially it's talking about Old Testament law, which is essentially that we sometimes call it the Mosaic law. Because God gave the Hebrews, who then became the Israelites, who wind up being called Jews, he gave them the law personally on Mount Horeb, which is the same as Mount Sinai. And it's interesting, when he gave the law, he told Moses to not let anybody come up and get on that mountain. They, they literally put barriers around it because they said if they put one foot on that, going up that mountain, they would die. And so God was going to speak to the people himself. And he did. And the people
people have started begging Moses, 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 please! Don't let God talk to us. He scares us too much. We're frightened. And so God had to go through Moses. I can't imagine what God's voice would sound like. But it must be something. Of course, he came down, there was a cloud over Mount Sinai, and he would bellow out these, you know, where you see in, in Exodus chapter 20, what we call the Ten Commandments. <clears throat> and much more. Anyhow, the law, the Mosaic law did four things. Number one, it demonstrated the sinfulness of man. Now, I'm going to ask you all a question and those who are listening online to see how close you've been paying attention. And, and, and your answer to this question is going to let you know uh, if you maybe missed something that we've already gone over. So point number one, it demonstrated the sinfulness of men because when they had the law and it said, thou shalt not, then you understood it. Or you shall, you'd understand that. But what about those without the law? <coughs> Excuse me. What did they have going for them even though they didn't know the law? In other words, the Jews acted as if you, if you don't have our law, the truth coming right from God, then you're fools. Then you're children. You don't have a clue what's going on. That's not what we have been studying, is it? Remember, the Gentiles who did not have the law became a law unto themselves because God wrote on their hearts the truth, gave them a conscience to understand. I guess it would be maybe easier for people to understand what is the law or what when, when the when the scriptures say thou shalt not, you, then it's, it's in writing. You know it that it's the that your sinfulness really comes through. But it doesn't mean that you have to have the law to know that you're a sinner either. Point number two: it kept a lid on the disobedience of the nation of Israel. We need that lid on us, don't we? And you know, I, I'm looking at this, I'm thinking, it kept a lid on the disobedience of the nation of Israel. That's not literal, is it? That lid, I guess, balled over and fell off sometimes, didn't it? Because they acted, it act, they acted as if they had no law and they were so utterly disobedient, you, you start to think, well, if they were that old disobedient, with the law, what would they be like without the law? Well, we got a glimpse of that. Moses was up on the mountain for 40 days, and they got tired of waiting, so they told Aaron, his brother, to make a golden calf. And when Moses was coming down off the mount, and Joshua had been on the mount lower down, and he asked Joshua, Joshua, what is that? Is that, that sound, is that war going on down there? And of course, Joshua said, no, uh, that's party time down there. And of course, we know that it was uh, no restraint, licentiousness and debauchery. Anyway, I thought that in making this, it did keep a lid on the disobedience of the nation of Israel because if you broke the law, you're going to have good neighbors to say, hey, you can't do that. Why? That's against the law. That type of thing. Point number three. It displayed the righteousness of God. Very important. It demonstrated to them that God was righteous and they are not. How much righteousness does man have as an unbeliever that would impress him? <laughs> That's, a, of course, a silly question. Whether it's an unbeliever or a believer, God is not impressed with us. He is only impressed 
in what he can do through us. That is how he is glorified. He does not put up with nonsense. Point number four. It also pointed out the need for a Messiah, which turned out to be Jesus Christ, who would remove the barrier of sin between men and God. Now, that's not to say that the law wasn't very beneficial to the Jews, and it is to us as well, even though we're not under the Mosaic law. You can go into Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and there are all kinds of specific laws that we might run into today. And you might think, okay, what should I do? Well, I'll give you an example. If you had an ox and it got out and gored somebody and they died, but it was the first time he got out and you didn't know it, then the person who, who died, uh, in other words, the owner would not be held accountable in that instance. But if he got out again, and gored somebody, it, it, let's say he killed someone, then the penalty for the owner would be death. Life for life. Have you ever watched Judge Judy? Sometimes they get in there, and it's amazing how many people go to court over their dogs. Dogs are lovely, they're good companions, but they're a pain. And if you go out, and even if you have them on a leash or whatever, they, they bite one another or bite they some, somebody else, or uh, they wind up in court. And they're trying to decide what should, what should they do. And, the, and Judge Judy is trying to get the information. Is this the first time this dog got out? Do you have a good fence to, to protect, the, keep him in or whatever? And one, I like to watch these things because I know the answer. When when the dog gets out and the people are totally irresponsible, then they have to pay not only the uh, vet bills for this dog, but uh, other things that might come in as well, and they have to pay it. So the Mosaic Law does a lot more than just these four things, but these are basic, and it's good. But... One of the main things it does is show that nobody can keep the law. And that's what these Jews were trying to do. They were so arrogant as to thinking that we have the law. I told you in 11 verses Tuesday, uh, I think it was 17 through 25, I think that's what it was. In those verses, out of 11 verses, that they mentioned the law 10 times. They were all about the law, but all in the wrong way because they were not about the law with regarding to obeying it. They would try to judge others by it while breaking it themselves. Believers who have been taught by prepared pastors who accurately exegete the Word of God are susceptible to the same conceited, pompous mindset that the Jews had. So it comes home and rests on us now. This is a very proper parallel. Because we have something that most people don't have. Even most believers don't have. Notice I said a prepared pastor who accurately exegetes the word of God. To those people who receive that information, there is a tendency or at least a temptation to start thinking that you are a cut above all these other people because you know things they don't know. And you might not be as patient as you should be in encouraging people who are biblically illiterate. You might not be encouraging. You might be impatient with them. But more than anything, you have an air that 
Well, I'm special to God because look at me, I know all these things that so many other people don't know. Do you understand? Do you agree that that can be a, a, a place that we don't want to go, but we, it, it's a temptation to every person because we have an old sin nature? Conceited, pompous mindset. We should be very careful that we never come across to unbelievers or even biblically ignorant believers as being condescending, better than thou, are superior. And we can't, not, we're not even trying to be, but we have to make a concerted effort not to be, even in the slightest way. And there's some believers that they know a lot of scriptures that they've memorized, and they know the Bible well, and sometimes they might show off. They just wanted to let people know, hey, I'm a, a Bible student, and I'm, I'm one of the elites. I know what's going on, and that's a tendency as well. But we don't want to come across as condescending or better than thou, our superior. I talked to people that were either uninitiated believers in the Word or unbelievers. And I start talking to them about God and His grace and His mercy and His plan and so forth. And they say, well, uh, yeah, I know, but you're saying that especially I don't get to talk to people without them asking me if I'm a pastor. Very few times can I talk to people about spiritual matters to the Bible or anything without them asking me, are you a pastor? And then when I say, yes, I'm a pastor, the, they always do the same thing. Oh, well, I'm just a sinner, you know. You, you, I, I can't under, you, you're over here. I, I'm just a sinner. And I have to go overboard. To say, hey, I'm a sinner too. If they're an unbeliever, I'll say the difference between you and me is I'm a saved sinner and you're a lost sinner. But we're all sinners. We have to do whatever it takes to give them some comfort that we're not on our high horse and they think, well, I'll never get to this elite place where you are. God's never going to accept me, then care about me. We have to do just the opposite. We have the same type of patterns of our old sin nature. We all have temptations. We've got, if, if we come across as them as being elite in any way, we've lost them. They think, I'll never make it. I can't get there. And we have to say, if I can be saved, you can be saved because it doesn't depend upon us anyway. All it depends on is the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did. And are you going to accept that as a gift? Or are you going to reject it? Something along those lines. We should be very careful what we never, that we never come across as condescending better than thou or superior. We should avoid technical Bible terminology. Example or Sanctification. What in the world are you using a word like that when you're talking to an unbeliever or a believer that all he knows is there's a New Testament and an Old Testament? What, 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 why would you use a word like that? Or here's some more. Justification. Escrow blessings. Predestination. And I could go on and on. You get the, you get my drift. You have to be on his level, but not in a condescending way. Because he didn't know what those words mean. And when you throw those words in, it makes him feel more inferior, which is what you don't want to do. That's why sometimes these scholars there in this rarefied air, because when I read their papers and I read these commentaries and so forth, they will take 35 words that can, that, to say something that could be said in five words. That's just where they are. I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to judge them or condemn them. It's, I don't know that they realize that when, when they converse with one another and they're comparing papers and all this, uh, they are on the same page and they all can follow one another. 
But if they use that same language when they're talking to their neighbor over here, uh, that does, maybe he has a Bible, maybe he doesn't, and he starts talking in that rarefied, elite verbiage, they're lost. I mean, th their neighbor isn't going to follow that. These are the things we have to be mindful of. Now, you might be talking to... All right, let me put this in the form of a question. What if you're talking to a physicist? And he is very educated, very elite in his advanced teaching and thinking. How would you talk to him? Would that mean that you can use these words like sanctification, justification, escrow blessings, predestination, and so forth? Right. No. He might be very smart, but he doesn't know squat about the Bible. And what happens sometimes when, and I hate to say this, but I'm sure I've done this myself before. When I, when I say a, 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 a distinct biblical terminology to someone, and they're impressed. We, it's have, you can have a tendency to think, oh, well, you think that was something? Listen to this. I don't know if you can identify with that, but most people can. We have to recognize that and just tamp that down. None of that matters. We're going right to what they can understand, and, but it's not condescending. So we should avoid technical Bible terminology, as I said. When talking to unbelievers are biblically ignorant believers. Listen, when you're talking to biblically ignorant believers, they can know less sometimes than unbelievers do about the Bible, about God, about Scriptures, and so forth. We need to engage people in a conversational manner by talking to them and asking them questions which is more successful than trying to act as their teacher, which they often take as preaching. People don't like to be preached to, but they like to have interesting conversations. I have to say, the people that I've been around in my lifetime that gave the gospel or was trying to get somebody interested in coming to church or anything like that, in my opinion, failed miserably. They weren't, it wasn't a conversation. It's like they were dragging their little mini pulpit up here and they get up on their box here and they're telling them everything they know about doctrine. Because they think if I just throw everything I know about doctrine, something's bound to stick. And the person is totally befuddled, has no idea what he's talking about, and think they're being preached to, and they resent it. If I had to say one thing, one error that more people make, Christians, in addressing other Christians that need training, are unbelievers, the number one thing they do is talk too much. And I think probably at one time or another we're all guilty of that. So people don't like to be preached to. But make your conversations interesting. We must determine if they are open to what we are saying and their body language will reveal what they are thinking. Listen, body language does not lie. And it tells you if they're interested. That's one way of knowing if they're interested and they'd like to hear more. Now, if somebody is sit, standing there with their arms crossed like this, they're kind of looking around at it. They want someone to look at their watch. <laughs> what does that tell you? They're not interested. They're not there. They're trying to figure out a way how to get out of this. If they aren't saying much, it's probably because you're talking too much. Ask them questions, and if they answer in one-word replies, 
It usually means they aren't interested and we should seek another opportunity to reach them at another time. Teenagers are the worst. When you talk uh, about uh, to teenagers, they, they haven't developed their conversation skills, especially these days. They don't talk. They just, you know, they stand right beside each other. They won't talk. They take from one another. But when you ask them, oh, I'll just give you an example. You see a teenager, might be in your family or neighbor or friend or something. How are you doing? Fine. Well, how, what, what's been going on? Nothing. Well, do you go to such and such high school? Yes. What is that telling you? They don't talk to you. They're not interested in what you have to say. The next question might be, can you answer me with more than one word? That might, I mean, that would be, I think, appropriate because you don't have any, you don't have any chance of having a conversation with them anyway, and that might get their attention. Especially if you're old. And just about all of us are old. And they go, oh, this is just an old fuddy-duddy person. They probably don't even have a cell phone. They don't even know who the latest rapper is. Uh, they, they, they don't want to talk to old folks. Now, there are laudable exceptions. And that shows how stupid they are because it's the old folks that have all the knowledge, which they don't care to have. They won't learn the hard way. So ask questions. That's a big deal. We're talking about how to reach these people and not be overbearing or condescending. Paul in verse 21, well, excuse me, now in verse 21, Paul goes after the religious leaders and teachers and lets them have it. Up to now, he's just talking to the people. Now he's specifically going after the leaders. He lets them have it and they richly deserve it. Note that he does not cite the things they are doing wrong. He doesn't go to... He's, I don't know if he's angry, but boy, is he, he's giving them a tongue lashing that was probably worse than 40 stripes with a whip. But it would be our temptation when the leaders are not doing their job. They're doing just the opposite. They're not helping, they're hurting. Our tendency is to go in there and say, look, you've done this and you've done that and you've done this other thing. It's all wrong. You're guilty of this. You're guilty of that. Isn't that what we would, normally the course we would take? Paul didn't go on that course. He doesn't accuse them of anything. What does he do? He asks them questions. So note that he does not cite the things they were doing wrong. Instead, he asked them questions. <clears throat> Excuse me. He knew the answers, and they knew he knew the answers, which was more powerful than just chewing them out. And I'll tell you why. I've got some more points on this, but let's read. This is verse 21, Romans 2, 21. You therefore who teach another do not teach yourself, you therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? Question. He was not saying, do you ever listen to what you're teaching? Do you ever do anything that you say you're teaching? Well, those, been quest those are questions too. Who preach, you who preach that one should not steal, do you steal? Now this is it. You wouldn't see this normally. Furthermore, Paul had been writing about rendering judgment and judging, so he does not judge them by accusing them of being thieves, adulterers, or blasphemers. How would that go? He's saying, don't judge other people. God is the one that judges, and so he starts, starts trying to straighten them out. What does he do? He starts accusing them, and they would say, you're judging me and all this. 
This is much more powerful. You'll never go wrong asking questions. Make things a question instead of a statement every time you can. It has more power. They stay engaged, and they can't just think about something else. The ball is in their court. They have to serve it back. It will get them to thinking. And these days, if you can just get someone to think instead of mumbling some worthless platitude, then you move the miles in the right direction because they don't think. When, especially when you're talking about the, the Scriptures or God or the spiritual realm, the first thing they do is they say, okay, let's see. I heard somebody somewhere say so-and-so, so they just throw out some bromide that thinks, oh, well, this, is, this should suffice. They don't even know what it means, but they heard somebody say it, so they parrot it, they repeat it. And all you have to do is ask them questions. Well, what does that mean? <gasps> They're dead. They've been exposed. They don't even know what it means. They're just trying to get rid of you, and if you, they say the right thing, maybe you'll leave. So he doesn't judge them by accusing them of being thieves, adulterers, and blasphemers. Those are the three things that he's going to address. He's going to ask them questions about it, but he didn't accuse them. And here's another reason. If he had accused them, they could have denied it or told him to prove his accusation. But by asking questions, they had to confront their guilt in their own soul. Brilliant. If he would have accused them of something, they would have gone on their defense and denied it or lied or whatever. They have the techniques to get around it. But when you ask them a question, you teach the people, do you do what you teach? Then what it does, they were forced to face their own hypocrisy. And he didn't accuse them of anything. All he did is ask them a question. And when they heard that question, they knew that were teaching others, but they were not doing it themselves, which made them a hypocrite. And they couldn't get angry at Paul. All he did was ask a question. If he'd made an accusation, they would put up a wall. Well, you're just judging me. Well, who are you to judge me? And they'll have excuses and so forth. I think that was brilliant. Here's a short poem about hypocrisy. And all of us have been hypocritical from time to time. It's a short one, but it's good. Here it is. The gospel is written a chapter a day by deeds you do and words that you say. Men read what you say, whether faithless or true. Say, what is the gospel according to you? <laughs> I thought that was pretty good. Every day we're writing a chapter about the gospel, our gospel, our good news. And so at the end he says, so what is the gospel according to you? Well, the, the gospel according to the Jews at that time was you have to obey the law. Exceedingly legalistic and false. By the way, that poem came from J. Vernon McGee through the Bible Commentary. Now, Paul mentions three common sins. Hypocrisy, which is a sin against ourselves. Adultery, which is a sin against others. And idolatry, which is a sin against God. And these are just, these are used in order for them and for us to see where their mindset was. And we need to avoid it like the plague. We don't want to be like that. I think, uh, let's see, let's go in our Bibles to Psalm chapter 50, verse 16. We might have time to come back, I don't know, probably not. Come back to Romans, that is. Romans, excuse me, <laughs> Psalm 50 
And we'll start with verse 16. Psalm 50, verse 16. He was talking about... Oh, by the way, this is a psalm of Asaph, A, capital A-S-A-P-H. He was David's director of music. So this is how he addressed... That is, Asaph addressed the type of leaders that Paul was speaking of. Verse 16. But to, but to the wicked, God says. The wicked in the Hebrew is closer to ungodly. He's talking about ungodly or wicked people. God says, What right have you to tell of my statutes and to make my covenant in your mouth? They were so far off course, it appears that God wouldn't even allow them to teach his statutes or have their his covenant in their mouth. Verse 17. For you hate discipline. The Hebrew word there better is instruction. For you hate instruction and you cast my words behind you. You don't want to hear them. You don't want to be instructed. Verse 18. When you see a thief, you are pleased with him, and you associate with adulter adulter adulterers. Verse 19. You let your mouth loose in evil, and your tongue frames deceit. I don't think it's a too far off base to recognize that could be talking to our leaders, couldn't it? You let your mouth loose in evil, and your tongue frames deceit. Verse 20. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. These things you have done, and I kept silent. Kept silence. You thought that I was just like you. Who's speaking here? God. I will reprove you and state the case in order before your eyes. That is a description that is similar to what the believers, or excuse me, the leaders of the Jews were. Now let's go to Matthew 23. Matthew 23 and verses 1 through 6. Matthew 23, 1. Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees have stated themselves, excuse me, seated themselves in the chair of Moses. That's pretty big shoes to fill there. Therefore, all that they tell you do and observe, but not, but do not do according to their deeds, for they say things and do not, and, and do not do them. Exactly what Paul is talking about. And they tie up heavy loads and lay them on men's shoulders. 
There would be taboos and traditions that the Bible does not forbid, but they did in their legalistic teaching. But they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much as a finger. That means they wouldn't lift a finger to help them to try to comply with these unnecessary, useless, unbiblical tra taboos and traditions. Verse 5. But they do all their deeds to be noticed. The Greek word there is theatron. It means to be seen publicly. It's where we get the word theater. But they do all their deeds to be noticed by men, for they broaden their phylacteries and lengthen the tassels of their garments. Do you all remember what phylacteries are? It'd be a little case with a strap around it, and they would put Scripture in it, and they would put it on their wrist, or they would put it up on their forehead like this to remind them of what the Scripture said. Well, nothing wrong with that unless you're doing it to impress people. What would you do if I came to church with phylacteries on my wrist and my forehead? Or better yet, if I walked downtown Brenham and I had that on, what would I do? I'd draw attention to myself, wouldn't I? And when some people would ask, what Shirley would say, what is that? Oh, well, I keep my scriptures in there. Well, what for? Well, I, I need to remember these things. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a very uh, spiritual man. Something along those lines. That's how they, And the tassels were on their robes and they tied little bells on the ends of their tassels. So when they came around, tinkle, tinkle all around, and people would think, oh, that's, that must be somebody important. That must be a scribe or a Pharisee. These are insufferable jerks full of pompous air. What verse did I say, Mom? Five, okay. So they broaden their phylacteries and lengthen the tassels of their garments. Verse 6. And they love the place of honor at banquets and the chief seats in the synagogues. And it goes on and on. It's just, it's, this is the insufferable leaders that these Jews had. I'll ask you another question now. Ooh, I got to make it quick. So these people were being reared and they lived there every day in the midst of horrible religious tyranny called legalism. Did that give them an excuse to be legalistic? Or if anyone wants to know the truth, is God going to give them, get that truth to them? Surely there were numbers of Jews at this time that were not arrogant and did not pick up on this condescending, better than thou, superior attitude towards Gentiles. By the way, it's different now anyway, isn't it? There is neither... Jew nor Gentile, remember? Slave or free, male or female, were all one in Christ Jesus. It wasn't that way then. So they still didn't have an excuse to sin because their leaders were leading them astray. If you want to know the truth, God will move mountains. He will do anything and everything necessary to get you that truth. That's the reason this church is here. There was a pocket of positive volition here, and God raised up a, a plumber. I was a plumber then. No, actually, when we started the church, I was in the log home business. But anyway, he raised up a person, a man that people thought 
You're a pastor? You're kidding. All that happened because he is going to get truth and his word into the souls of those who want it. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. That's a promise. So they, these people that were under these rulers, couldn't excuse themselves because God always has a remedy. We're out of time. Let's close. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your grace and your plan and the revelation of these people who, unfortunately, we can identify with in some areas. We pray that we will be humble, not fake humility, but truly humble when we're talking to people who don't have the benefit of having the truth. And that we'll be very careful not to seem like we're better than they are because we are not. And that they will give us a hearing and that we will remember not to get on our soapbox and preach, but just have a conversation with them and lead them, persuade them to the truth so they too can be royal family members of the Most High. We pray that you will challenge us, this, challenge us with this and that when we engage other people, it will be for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.